Hey guys, so we're going to go over what you're going to be doing in the Hess's Law experiment today. First thing is we have to assemble a calorimeter using a beaker and a styrofoam cup. Uh, so we're putting the styrofoam cup in the beaker, tapping it in. And then the point of the beaker is to hold it without transferring a lot of heat from your hand. Um, and then we're going to have a temperature probe. It's this little sort of pill shaped thing on the end of this long wire. And we want to stick this in the very bottom of our styrofoam cup, um, which I am super struggling to do here. Um, the wire is super bendy and it's just gonna fall out anyway. So what we want to do to make sure that it doesn't slip out is tape it to the inside of the cup. So rip off a couple of pieces of tape here. So I'm gonna shove the uh, temperature probe back in the bottom take one piece of tape and tape it on the inside of the cup. And then once I finish doing this, I'm gonna also tape the wire to the outside of the cup to just prevent the thing from slipping out, just to make sure. So you use this calorimeter for, for all of the data collection, you'll do like five or so reactions, but yeah, I've taped it to both sides of the cup and in the very bottom, you can see the temperature probe. Right? So that's all set up. Uh, now onto sort of dispensing the chemicals. So I have about one molar hydrochloric acid here. Um, I'm doing the second part of the experiment and the third reaction. So this is about one molar uh, aqueous hydrochloric acid and about a gram of solid sodium hydroxide. So pouring the HCl out into a beaker and then using a graduated cylinder to measure 50 milliliters of it. Now in your guys' drawers you only have 25 milliliter graduated cylinders so I'm gonna have to do this measurement twice and pour both additions in. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly 50 milliliters just Somewhere close, um, you know, within a milliliter or so is fine. Uh, but I think I measured 24 and a half a milliliter and then like 24.8 or 0.9 or something, right? And then just sum them together to figure out the total volume of uh, aqueous one molar hydrochloric acid. So that's what I was recording there. Um, so add, add one graduated cylinders worth and then do it again. You'll notice when I'm pouring this that I'm sort of bent over. I'm trying to read the meniscus on this graduated cylinder at eye level. I did a couple of taps there because as I was pouring, uh, I formed quite a few bubbles, so it was going to be hard to read the meniscus, so I was just trying to clear those out. But record my second volume, add that to our styrofoam cup calorimeter. So just to show you guys what I'm sort of writing down, right? So got a volume of HCl, let's write those two together. Right, so the temperature probe is submerged in my hydrochloric acid, it's at the bottom of the cup. So now to set this up, uh, what we want to view is the graph, right? So I'm gonna scroll down a couple and hit the check mark to select it. And so here's a graph that will dis display temperature on the y-axis and time in seconds on the x-axis. Um, so before starting, I need to mass a couple of, or my hydroxide and vial. So your experiment says to get about a gram of sodium hydroxide solid. Um, they're these little white pellets and we've actually weighed them out in vials for you guys. So I'm gonna weigh the total vial with the solid and the cap on it, record that number. Right? All of that sodium hydroxide should be about a gram. So what we want you guys to do is take the vial, shake it up before you try to pour it because the, the pellets have a tendency to sort of adhere to the walls of the glass. So I'm gonna shake that up a second and then all of it needs to end up in this cup. But before I do that, I need to start recording data. So I'm gonna push play, right? When I do that, we should see it start collecting a bunch of data points as the time goes, which it does, right? And this should be a flat line. The cup is at room temperature. Everything in the cup's been sitting in this lab for a long time. It should just be a flat temperature of about, I don't know, 23 or so degrees Celsius, 
right? So I've shaken this little vial up and I'm going to start swirling my cup. And as I'm swirling my cup, I'm going to pour in all of that solid and then just keep swirling. You'll notice in the background, my hand sort of never stops. Um, the goal in this to keep swirling is so that your reaction proceeds consistently. Um, so you should see on this uh, GLX sort of blue device, you should see the graph start to climb up steadily. It's not, it still looks like a flat line. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit F1 and that's gonna scale it, right? And you'll notice in this graph, I actually have a few bumps. Uh, it's not the cleanest, smoothest. Um, I potentially might have restarted this one and that's because there's points where I stopped swirling to do something in this video, right? But I'm trying to swirl consistently the whole time. Right. And, and, and this whole reaction takes maybe two minutes. It's going to seem like an eternity, but just keep swirling gently, sort of keep circular motions going. Right. And again, we're putting this beaker on here primarily to prevent my hand from touching the styrofoam cup and releasing or transferring a lot of heat onto that styrofoam cup. Right. So it's going to keep going. Eventually, the solid pellets that I added to this cup will have completely dissolved and the reaction's eventually going to stop, right? At which point the temperature should stop rising in the cup. There's no longer any heat being released by the reaction that should start to plateau off and drop and eventually cool down to room temperature, right? So I think I'm getting pretty close here. So I'm I'm largely looking in the cup to see if the solids are still present, giving it some swirling. You guys can see on this graph here, it's sort of starting to curve and flatten out. All right, so I think I'm done. I've swirled for a little bit longer from when I think the reaction was completed, and now I'm just gonna let it sit for a while. Right. So my reaction is done. I've, I've reached the top of this curve, and now I'm sort of waiting for 30 seconds or so to let, uh, let the data collect and sort of get this last bit of the graph. Right. And so that, that's all you're going to do in this experiment in terms of data collection. You'll need the masses of the vial, the masses with, with sodium hydroxide in it, the mass of the vial without sodium hydroxide in it, and then the volume of the solutions or liquids that you guys measure in the lab, right? Um, and then the majority of the data is going to come from this uh, little PASCO data logger blue device that's shown on the screen, right? So this, this graph is being displayed and it's recording temperature and time data, right? So I've, I've, we need to get that data off of this. So I've let it sort of cool and recorded that data for a good chunk of time here. So eventually here, I'm gonna push play to unintuitively stop recording data here in a second. And then we'll go through how do you get the data off of this device? So yeah, I think, I think we're good. So I'm going to push play to stop recording, right? And then to get the data off of this, you guys are going to need a USB stick. Um, so just showing you, there's no solids currently dissolved in this thing that dissolved quite a while ago before it stopped cooling off, right? So I'm going to reweigh this thing now that it's empty, record that mass, right? Um, I don't have a lab notebook here. You guys would be recording this in your lab notebook in pen, right? But everything's well labeled, including units. So that way, you know, when you go to do the report a few days later, you still know what your numbers mean, right? So like I said, we gotta get the data out of this thing. So I got a flash drive, USB stick, thumb drive, whatever you wanna call it, um, goes on the side. So. If you have one of these, um, bring it to lab. Uh, preferably if you have a small one, the memory on these devices is kind of, well, not the grandest and it can struggle processing larger thumb drives. So I've gone to the table view 
and this is blurry, but it says run one, then it has temperature data. And I need the time data to show up on the right. So I'm going to hit check, then I'm going to scroll over to the right column, hit check again, and one of the options is time. So I'm going to select that by hitting check again. So now I've got the temperature data displayed and the time data displayed, and I'm ready to pull the data off of this thing. So I'm going to hit F4 and then scroll down to a selection that says export all data. And so I'm going to, I'm going to select that. And then it's going to show a window. I'm just going to hit OK. Right. So it's going to say exporting data to the US or the data to the USB thing. This takes sometimes a fraction of a second, sometimes 30 seconds. But once the data is exported, it will say it's complete, and then you just hit OK. Now, you guys in lab will have to do this for all of the runs you collect. I just did this one run. So, right, we, we take this out and slap it into our computer and take the data off the file, right? So uh, excuse the shaky camera for a second while I move over here and sort of discuss what you guys are going to do with this graph. So we're eventually going to get the heat absorbed by the surroundings uh but so so sort of to go here there's no reaction at the start right and then once you see the temperature start ticking up that's the start of the reaction once you see it start ticking down or where it peaks that's the end of the reaction right so in order to figure out the heat of the surroundings we need to know the mass of the surroundings the specific heat capacity which you guys will assume the surroundings are mostly water so you'll use that and the temperature change right and so we can use this graph to figure out a more accurate temperature change. While it's cooling at the end, it's very obvious. While it's heating up from the start of the reaction to the end of the reaction, it is also cooling, right? If it wasn't, you would expect a line straight up or as hopefully as straight up as I can draw a line here, right? So when the reaction starts, if there's no heat being lost, the sort of air or other things, you would expect just a straight temperature change, a vertical temperature change, right? And so we can extrapolate this rate of cooling back, right, which is what I'm trying to draw here, to that start of the reaction to account for the heat lost just to the sort of air or whatever uh, as the reaction is proceeding. So we have our initial temperature and our final temperature where the reaction starts and where that line would extrapolate back to. Right. So that's how you can get potentially a better temperature change to calculate the heat gained by the surroundings in the experiment. So thanks for watching.